much. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'm even more honored that you all are here after lunch. I thought the room would be half empty. So it's really, really great to see the enthusiasm and the interest from various people who've had experience with this as caregivers, as survivors, and, and then of course as clinicians as well. Um, so thanks a lot. This is, uh, I'm excited to be here. Everyone can see what this is, right? I know it looks dark and then you may not be able to tell it first, but do you see the rabbit? Yeah, you see the bunny, right? So um, this is kind of the face that I get from um, fellow clinicians sometimes, neurologists, internal medicine physicians, um, psychiatrists, uh, rheumatologists, residents, pretty much everybody, when we talk about this topic, the diagnostic tools, um, because as you have heard throughout the day, you know, this is a young growing field and things are not black and white. There's a lot of gray and the things that are black and white, it's nice, but um, somehow the gray tends to be, at, currently at least, there's more gray right now than, you know, than I think that patients would like to see and then even as doctors and, that we'd like to see. So um, I think it's fair to say that even us as clinicians sometimes feel this way. I know I have. And um, in terms of which tests to order, how to interpret certain ones, because this field is constantly changing. So I will do my best to uh, focus this in terms of you know, evidence-based testing. Um, there's a lot of, obviously, uh, you know, passion out there about uh, certain antibodies that we do and don't know about, or seronegativity, et cetera, which is very well um, you know, warranted. But I'm gonna do my best to make sure that at least in this forum, uh, you know, we at least figure out what is out there and expert-wise what is recommended by the other experts. So diagnostic tools and challenges for the work of autoimmune encephalitis. These are probably the main points um, that I'm going to discuss, uh, like I said, based on available evidence and the experience of several experts whom you've heard today. So starting with who to test, I'm gonna preface with since Dr. Delmao, Dr. Tillar, everybody has really touched on certain syndromes, uh, antibody-mediated syndromes that we know well. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those. That's, that could take another day. So really, this is going to be a focus on, one, autoimmune encephalitis, knowing that there's a suspicion for it, not just encephalitis alone, as Dr. V did that earlier this morning, because that differential is wide as well. So um, there's a paper that we've seen cited several times today. Um, it's an amazing position paper, and I think Dr. Um, Warren and I had the same excitement when we saw this. So he's going to have to share his candy store because, you know, the three highlighted speakers, you've heard them today, all, all three of them. And that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, the people that I've, I'm, you know, showing you papers from, I've learned from, I'm now talking with them. And just, you know, it's, it's for me, it's, it's really exciting and it's very surreal. So in terms of proposed diagnostic criteria for possible autoimmune encephalitis, that was in uh, Dr. Grouse's paper, um, we went through some of this earlier, but just to reiterate, this is kind of what, as clinicians, we should be thinking about. Uh, so starting with subacute onset. So that means onset within three months or less than three months. Nothing that's been going on for years. And whether it's of working memory, which is short-term memory loss, so that, is, that implies hippocampal dysfunction. So your brain doesn't have the ability to really have things online, temporarily available for retrieval and use. And also the inability to manipulate information. Well, when you can't temporarily hold on to something, how are you going to manipulate it? So um, the other thing is altered mental status or psychiatric symptoms, which is my favorite um, because of my neuropsych background. So psychiatric symptoms, again, we must keep in mind the subacute part of this. I want to emphasize that over and over again because that is really why I think sometimes, you know, diagnoses get missed or... Patients get misdiagnosed. Uh, you know, if something's been going on for years and years and years, it's, uh, there should be at least due diligence to say, you know, are we looking everywhere else? Are we looking, do we need to zoom out and look at our differential again? It's just warranted. We owe that to the patients. And I think uh, in return, I think the families too, uh, you know, have to be on the same page that maybe we're focusing in on something too much because we're wanting it to be true. So it's just good to keep that in mind. Uh, the other next criteria is uh, at least one of the following. So in context of new focal CNS findings or new onset seizures, so with no diagnosis of previous seizure disorder, 
And um, CSF theocytosis, so this is a brief overview. We'll go more into detail. So usually white blood cells more than five. And uh, MRI features suggestive of encephalitis, but however, as we heard today, generally the MRI is not very helpful unless it's one of the encephalitides that it's very characteristic for that Dr. Delma mentioned. So as a cognitive clinician, I feel like I have a bit of a different viewpoint in addition to what everyone else has said today. Uh, this is Dr. McKeon's paper from around the same time in 2016, and this is in the Continuum article. So he basically, this whole paper is about describing ways to distinguish a neurodegenerative process versus autoimmune-mediated cognitive impairment or cognitive decline, which is really important. I'm a memory disorders doctor. So when patients come to me at the age of 60, 65, 70, and 90, and say, you know, saying that I can't concentrate, I've, um, I'm tired, et cetera, et cetera, my memory's all gone, everyone's talking about Alzheimer's. And if you look at some of the criteria, again, similar, so subacute onset and rapidly progressive course, Alzheimer's does not happen over three months. And that is, neurodegenerative diseases, unless failed to be noticed early on, you will realize as you pry and pry, those are gradually progressive things. Whereas autoimmune and autoimmune mediated cognitive impairment or autoimmune um, etiology of attentional deficits, which some of the I mean, some of the survivors have also mentioned. Though that's you, if you've had autoimmune encephalitis, you know what I'm talking about, and that is really important to differentiate because a lot of the 50, 60 year olds, they're not in that you know. It's not that old, actually, and so they're not in that right range where you think, oh, you know, but they do get written off and dismissed. Oh, you have Alzheimer's, you know, done, or this is just aging, you know, forget it. But sometimes I feel that we have to take out time to at least ask them some of those key things. Yes, Alzheimer's is very prevalent. However, as we've seen today, this is an autoimmune encephalitis forum, so the things that we think are rare May, are really not that rare, and things that we think are so common, yes, this is by default because everyone's getting older. However, it's something that is reversible and treatable, cognitive impairment due to autoimmune etiology, and it must be, must be at least um, ruled out as a, a possibility in light of something that is not typical cognitive impairment for a neurodegenerative illness. A couple of other key symptoms that he actually uh, mentions is tremor. So a new onset tremor, let's say in an 80-year-old, Okay, so you want to make sure you do your due diligence again, meds, et cetera. So once you've ruled out the most common causes, that's something to think about. Why is that happening all of a sudden at 80 or 75 or 70? Um, and then headache, sudden unremitting headaches. And in an older patient, uh, again, once the most common things have been addressed and ruled out, it just is something to say, you know what, note to self and note to self to ask as well. Sometimes we just don't ask um, unless the patient complains about some of these things. And then history of recent um, or past neoplasms, and that, again, perineoplastic aspect of it also affects cognition and can affect cognition in some of the syndromes. Inflammatory CSF or MRI, so I will go deeper into this, but any inflammation in terms of evidence, you know, on testing for one of these two things is, again, something that uh, is, he proposes as part of the criteria, which is similar to the other one that you saw, the other criteria. And then, of course, uh, if you have a positive neural antibody, I think that we don't need to worry about the other things as, as long as it clinically fits the picture. Um, and plus or minus diagnostic trial of immunotherapy, I am not going to go down that rabbit hole right now, maybe later if we have time. So we will discuss that. In, if someone is, um, you know, we haven't found the antibody, should we do a trial or what warrants that to see if they get better on it? So who to test, again? I want you to just look at these two, I am just trying to drive a point home, is that if we just put these two papers together, which I clearly really love, and just run through these things with our patients, I really think that, you know, we would really, we can minimize and do a good rule out of, of differentials and autoimmune mediated type of cognitive impairment or any other uh, symptoms that have this type of course and um, symptomatology. So don't worry for the seronegative, I know you are very uh, enthusiastic about this. So. I don't like that word, that particularly, you know, seronegative, antibody negative. I prefer the scientific term, sero, I don't know, because 
You know, GFAP was discovered recently. Uh, as far as, you know, in this world, it's pretty recent, uh, two, three years ago. And MD receptor encephalitis, you know, but what was it prior to 2007, 2006? Like, these things are, we, we can't pretend we know everything. We don't know much about the brain at all. I mean, we'd like to, but I think the, these syndromes, autoimmune, in general, autoimmune disorders, they're very humbling diseases. Uh, you know, the minute you think you know it all, is the minute that that patient is positive when you're like, I could have sworn they weren't. And the minute that you think a patient is going to be positive is the minute that they're not. This looks exactly like an MDA, but nothing comes back positive. And all of a sudden, you have to go looking elsewhere and making sure. So it's something to really keep in mind. Um, the humility extends all the way. And this is one of those diseases and disorders that it definitely should be uh, something to, uh, to think about. I want to mention one other thing in terms of uh, Dr. McKeon's um, criteria. He mentions family history of autoimmune disease or personal history of autoimmune disease. So in any autoimmune disease, one of the risk factors, a big risk factor is what? You guys tell me. Any, any, I want to make this interactive if you're in a food coma. What do you guys think it is? Any, some of the, yes, exactly. Yeah, if you, if you have one autoimmune disease, you are more at risk than somebody who doesn't to develop a second one. That includes autoimmune encephalitis, autoimmune encephalopathy. So, you know, I'm not asking for everybody to get extensive family histories. Just ask, does anyone in your family have it? And I just kind of rattle them off, like five or six of the most common ones, thyroid disease, lupus, Sjogren's, et cetera. And those are weird enough names to where the patient may not themselves tell you, but they'll recognize them when you say them out loud. And so it's really worth kind of putting that in your note because it's always about the clinical picture. And I think, you know, any, tr any residents that are here and some of the faculty that are here, they've heard me say this in the past. It's about the clinical picture. This plus this plus this plus this equals this. Whether it's for the insurance company, whether it's for your own diagnostic, you know, um, your own kind of like diagnostic uh, accuracy, it's really important never ever to take some, just one thing in isolation and run with it. You know, they're well, running around with abnormal MRIs, but they're asymptomatic. We don't treat them for things. And uh, vice versa. People are running around with symptoms that are really, really, you know, bothersome and affect their daily functioning. And that's when we consider treating them. So when we add all these things up, they, you can really say, okay, now I, I can put this together for you and convince almost anybody if they're willing to listen why I think this is what it is. For the sero or antibody unknown, look at the criteria. It's clearly way more stringent. You have to meet, meet way more criteria. You know, you run a lot more tests, which makes sense as well. Because if there is no antibody found, but you have these abnormalities and it meets all of this, you are able to at least justify, as a clinician, I'm able to at least justify saying, you know what, I want to try giving you steroids or try giving you IVIG. And I can justify it to myself as well as my colleagues, as well as to the patient and their family. So um, it's, it's something to really keep in mind. And it's very, very helpful to have that. Okay, the other thing <clears throat> we've touched on a bit, uh, quite a bit as well today is uh, the diagnostic criteria for Hashimoto's encephalopathy. So I'm not going to dwell on it, but as you've heard a lot of us say today, you know, it, it's, uh, we don't, we, nobody knows yet if it's actually the TPO or thyroglobulin antibody. If, and it's, I guess from the experts, I'm going to defer to do, experts like Dr. Del Mao because, you know, it's something that has shown up in patients, again, without them being symptomatic. It's shown up in patients who actually have, before their other antibody tests come back positive, you'll get these like mild elevations that we consistently put in our note, non-specific elevated TPO antibody. Okay, it's non-specific for the moment, but it might mean something later once you figure out what is actually happening. And so again, the criteria is way more stringent and it, strict and it makes sense. These things are pretty much across the board, widely accepted. There's a general consensus that these things should at least be part of the workup if we're suspecting autoimmune encephalitis. And what do we test in serology? Of course, we want to make sure we rule out things like the perineoplastic panel, the encephalitis panel. That was extensively talked about earlier today as well. So just to reiterate, antibodies to neural, neuronal cell surface um, and Antigens, so these are the ones that, LG, things like LGI-1, you guys have heard this, all the NMDAR. So these are the ones that um, we want to make sure we test, we send off for testing. I probably shouldn't say any particular labs that I send them to. It doesn't matter as long as they get done correctly. And as long as clinicians know how to order them, which sometimes, as, as crazy as it sounds, that is a challenge, actually. Because when tests are not commonly ordered, sometimes the lab doesn't know. And this is the pitfalls part of it from the beginning of the slide, which is 
you know, these are the challenges we come across as clinicians every day. And it sounds sometimes silly, but if it's not ordered correctly, the patient has gone and had a lumbar puncture and you co they come back to you and you're like, oh, gee, sorry, the lab sent off the wrong test. I mean, I wouldn't be so understanding. You punctured my, you put a hole in my back and you gave me a headache afterwards. And now you're telling me I need to go do it again. So, and already, you know, it's a suspicion, right? So because of your suspicion, you want me to go get another. It just becomes this thing and you want to be able to justify what you're doing as a workup. So it's really worth coordinating with the lab, which all of these things take time and that no one has. However, it's in the, if we're going to be patient-centric, it's important, and it's part of the workup that's important. And then, of course, the perineoplastic antibodies that also have been discussed today. These are the ones that have the uh, tumor association, and also the response to immunotherapy is poor because the underlying and root cause is generally a tumor. Uh, whereas on the other end, for the cell surface uh, antibodies, usually the prognosis is better and the immunosuppressive therapy tends to actually have a really good response, as you saw earlier in the videos. Okay, CSF studies. So for people who were listening earlier or um, already know as clinicians, this one is actually, there's few tests in the CSF that you should run and must run. And uh, there is a resident in here from Cornell today, and I'm sure he knows them, so he's not allowed to speak up. But other clinicians, like, what do you think are, like, the basic CSF tests we should run? Just because it's an autoimmune case doesn't mean you want some of the basic stuff, right? So assuming suspected autoimmune encephalitis, what do you want to make sure you get? Any, any thoughts? Sure, yeah, we could get, yes, yes, especially after what we heard today in terms of certain, like, triggers. Okay, what else? She said viral PCR. Any other ones? Yeah, you do your basic cells, protein, glucose, but what else? I'm looking for oligoclonal bands and IgG index. And that, it sounds so like, duh, the way you guys say it, but it's often not done. It's often not ordered. And that's not anyone's fault. It's just a lack of knowledge and awareness because those are the things that can give you a heads up to inflammation, et cetera. So lymphocytosis in the, uh, in the uh, CSF, pleocytosis, elevated protein count, you know, it's not going to be where, and that's going to be even more important for patients who come back without a, a, a detected antibody in the CSF. If they have IgG index that's elevated, if, and, or even a little bit of presence of oligoclonal bands, even if you have two or three. And I was, at least that's what I was told, that that's not normal, period. And so um, it's really something to take into consideration and, and make sure it gets ordered. Um, and then, of course, the perineoplastic panel, if that's what you're thinking, or autoimmune encephalopathy panel, so there is a difference, as you have seen, right? Perineoplastic versus cell surface. However, you'd be surprised how often, because clinicians aren't aware and you know, everyone doesn't know about this disease clearly, perineoplastic panel gets ordered just because they have a suspicion for autoimmune encephalitis. That is, if you don't think there's an underlying perineoplastic, like a neoplastic process, we cannot order perineoplastic panels. Does that, that make sense, right? I mean, you don't have to be a doctor to know that. However, because it's not taught on a, a really kind of a routine basis, Oftentimes, these are the things that get missed. And these are the pitfalls, by the way, aside from the bigger pitfalls of this growing field, is the day-to-day -day kind of um, haphazard things that can happen sometimes. In terms of imaging, as everyone has realized that most of the MRIs uh, come back normal, 50%, 60%, unless it's imaging done in uh, GABA that we talked about already, or uh, limbic encephalitis, LGI-1, um, However, the other thing that I've noticed in practice actually is, you know, the report coming back as not specific white matter disease, microvascular, likely due to microvascular ischemic changes, chronic, severe. Well, if the patient has no hyperlipidemia, so no high cholesterol, no high blood pressure, no sleep apnea, no cardiac disease, no AFib, why are they having these chronic microvascular ischemic changes and that are nonspecific? And generally, the ones that I'm referring to don't really fit a picture of, you know, uh, cerebrovascular processes. And so, again, we're not as aware of these things. They get read as nonspecific. So I would say any neurologist, any psychiatrist should do their due diligence and look at the scan yourself. I make my patients bring their old scans, and I say, I'm sending you for another one. I want, I want to compare it. Uh, you have to drive that point home because subtle changes, the neuroradiologist is not going to pick up. It's going to look like age-appropriate, you know, white matter disease or, um, or even atrophy with superimposed autoimmune encephalitis. So when we talk about older patients and cognitive impairment, 
I have three of those patients and they, we sent the Alzheimer's panel on them because they had the pattern of decline seemed consistent, but this patient was only 58. And so um, I was like, we also should send the autoimmune panel. We're getting his CSF. We might as well test it because it was acute changes over two months that were very different from like the two years of like underlying memory issues, word finding difficulty, tip of the tongue syndrome that a lot of us have. If we don't even get, an, if we don't get proper sleep, we'll have that, right? So this patient had an acute memory decline, but if he was, I bet you if he was 70 years old, oh, this is Alzheimer's, don't worry about it. But no, why is this memory change different? It's acute and that's, and he actually has both. And so that's, he's getting IVIG. So it's, we can, we wanna reverse what we can reverse. He's already young and he has, you know, early onset Alzheimer's. And if we're not gonna be able to treat his autoimmune encephalitis on top of it, well, that's, there's your quality of life. And so, I mean, that even surprised me. And so I was hanging my head on autoimmune and one of the other clinicians says, I think this is Alzheimer's and we were both correct. And so seeing that kind of exacerbate, you know, something that's supposed to be a chronic illness, gradually progressive, um, it's, it, it, it's really, really something when you can actually treat the patient and see a response um, and get them at least back to the baseline they're at, which is uh, mild cognitive impairment and not completely decline in activities of daily living, et cetera. The other thing this paper actually I really like, it pointed out that um, there, there was a, they looked at another study that did an fMRI uh, in autoimmune encephalitis. And what they noted, fMRI and DTI. So on diffusion tensor imaging, they noticed extensive white matter disease. And then with um, fMRI in the anterior hippocampal networks, they noticed hypometabolism, which was touched on a little bit earlier as well by one of the other speakers. But this is something, you know, one year we have all this evidence and we say, oh, this is what it is. There's so much NMDAR that's associated with the teratoma. Um, but now we're coming to realize those numbers are changing. Those figures are changing. And so it's, th so this will also continue to change what imaging looks like. And is there something really that we can do on imaging that can say, okay, now we can track um, uh, treatment response. Now we can say if someone's going to have a relapse, now we can say this is what characteristically autoimmune encephalitis of many syndromes looks like. Um, and I think that is something that in terms of future developments should uh, happen. And it's just takes forever for these things to happen. Um, contrast enhancement on MRI can be very helpful. You know, we wanna make sure we're not missing something like metastatic disease, other vascular um, anomalies, um, and things that, uh, you know, common things are common. And uh, those things are more common than autoimmune encephalitis. So it should be considered and tested for. Clinical pearls, so this is kind of something that I, I tell the residents and, I, uh, and colleagues and in general, and I myself, um, you know, keep in mind, and it's just a, basically a summary slide. History is key, you know, I know that we're in 2019, you know, we've made some really, we've made some advances, and uh, oftentimes, as young of a clinician as I am, I like the old school way of, you know, get that history, because with autoimmune, if you're not asking about prodromal symptoms, like viral symptoms, prior to sudden onset of confusion and altered mental status, you could miss something that could be part of that big picture. And um, when we see patients with trainees, when we see patients with other colleagues, family history, patients' personal history of autoimmune disease and viral prodrome, you know, all those things add up. If someone out of nowhere starts hallucinating and has bizarre behavior and is taking a shower with their clothes on and talking to someone who's not there, I know enough to know with my psych training as well that schizophrenia doesn't happen overnight. There is a prodrome and um, generally it doesn't happen when you're 45. It, yes, it has a bimodal distribution, but it just doesn't, it's not like this. And what you'll often notice is that, you know, acute onset means over, the, over a day or two days, few days, even weeks, but schizophrenia doesn't work like that. Some of the aspects of bipolar disorder, those symptoms, they, that, that's not how it works, you know, and oftentimes patients may also describe things in a way that can confuse the doctor. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was really manic. And I'm like, no, I don't want those, I don't want medical terminology. What do you mean by manic? What does that mean to you? Meanwhile, they're actually describing an anxiety attack. So <laughs> very different, okay? Um, and I think as clinicians, we should keep that in mind. Paradoxical response to neuroleptics. <laughs> that's a really important one. For whatever reason, um, in my experience and from some of the literature that I've read, you know, someone getting high doses of Haldol for agitation, we must, I agree with everyone else and I do the same thing, we have to, you know, control the 
current symptoms. However, if you notice that someone gets Ativan or a benzodiazepine that's supposed to knock you out and they are super bouncing off the walls, that's called a paradoxical re response. Um, so that should be noted. There's a reason that their body's immune system, whatever it is, sensitivity, et cetera, it's not reacting appropriately. Um, and that's just something that, again, adds to the clinical picture. Um, refractory seizures, a lot of the autoimmune patients I've seen, they're on five anti-epileptics. I mean, and also on propofol, isoflurane if they're admitted. And one of them actually responded to ECT for refractory seizures. I mean, that's, it was an amazing case. And she had an unknown antibody. We thought she was gonna die. She was in the ICU for 10 to 12 weeks. 23-year-old uh, uh, girl, and she walked into my office three weeks ago, very upset that I'm giving her cytoxin and making her hair fall out. So I'm like, you know what? You can hate me all you want. You're alive, and we're happy that you're alive because everyone thought you weren't going to be. So it's those things really, you know, ECT is not a known thing for refractory seizures. This is something pretty novel. Columbia's done, I mean, from what we know, Columbia's done it, has few case reports on it. Uh, we reached, our leptologist is amazing. She reached out to them. We coordinated with them, you know, what did you do for your protocol? We coordinated with psychiatry. I mean, there was a lot of a lot of things in what we convinced the parents who were Indian and who were like, you wanna do what to my daughter? I mean, so, and that, it actually helped. Uh, and then the other thing that we did is gave her a toxin and cytoxin, basically killed her immune system. But it worked. Um, and those are the stories, probably few and far between, but how do we know they're few and far between? That's my one question, if we don't, if we don't try it within reason, obviously. Um, pitfalls, I've talked about some of them along the way. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, serology, we've discussed that, A, if there is an unknown antibody or the fact that disease um, and clinical symptoms don't always correlate with titers and, um, we know we're, and it's hard to follow that for treatment response. So what do you base your treatment on? And if you've done a lot of the other things, you can hopefully base it on a trend, hopefully. Um, and that's something that I think, again, you know, everyone's doing great work on that. Uh, and we need to continue to do it to really define in a much better and more accurate way some of the syndromes that we, you know, can't recognize or that we don't know about, the antibodies that we don't know about. So I, I think that this is a really exciting field. And we are, like, at that point where it's going to blow up. Um, and the fact that there's this many of you in here, I think it already has to some degree. So... Um, uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions, I think, later.